if you look at our uh, center website, you'll see that uh, it lists two modest goals. Uh, uh, one is uh, understand human intelligence, and the other is use this understanding to create intelligent machines. Of course, uh, people have been thinking about this for centuries, and uh, as is usual in science, when encountering a very difficult problem, um, researchers broke it up into uh, simpler, uh, smaller pieces, hoping to understand them better separately. And over the years, uh, this uh, divide and conquer approach, at least in artificial intelligence, uh, gave uh, uh, rise to several um, very successful disciplines. Uh, robotics, uh, natural language processing, machine vision, and so forth. But more recently, um, some of us started wondering whether um, this approach, especially when applied to understanding and replicating intelligence, um, has its drawbacks and limitations. Humans do not live in a unimodal world. And, uh, cognitive tasks uh, that we perform always includes multiple modalities. When I see something, I describe it in language. When I hear you tell me something, I imagine uh, what the described things, uh, objects or events, uh, look like in the world. We are constantly bombarded uh, by multimodal sensory inputs, and the redundancy and the complementary nature of these inputs help us better understand and better function in our world. And perhaps uh, by studying these modalities in isolation, we make the problem harder rather than easier. So my group's research trajectory is a case in point. Um, for many years, uh, we have been working on natural language processing, um, and in particular, on, uh, we focused on parsing and generation in the context of question answering. Uh, we created the world's first question answering system many years ago, as soon as the web came about. Uh, the system is called START, and uh, here on the slide you see some of the tools uh, that START offers. So basically we go from language to structure, uh, if needed, from structure to language, and also um, various question answering and explanation um, capabilities. Over the years, uh, the START technology, technology that we developed at MIT, uh, directly inspired the development of a number of uh, commercial systems, and you see some of them here. Uh, many of these systems, are, especially the later ones, are quite successful and used by millions of people every day. Um, however, I very much hope that none of you think that any of these systems are intelligent. Uh, they're good at retrieving facts uh, from knowledge base or from the web, but they fail miserably um, at simplest common sense questions, for example. Um, so if you ask any child uh, what would happen if someone was holding a cup and let go, the child will immediately tell you the cup would drop to the floor. Well, no commercial or research system today can do that. Um, we believe that such questions can be solved by incorporating uh, perception into our language models. Um, we think that humans answer such questions, such common sense questions, by uh, mentally uh, generating videos of such, uh, in this case, let go actions. And uh, interesting, on Monday, uh, Nancy uh, described this as a uh, mental simulation engine uh, in our head. 
So these uh, imaginary videos uh, help us visualize um, uh, the consequences of, of the action and uh, we use this visualization, we humans, uh, to answer the question. And our group uh, is working on making our machines do this as well. Another problem uh, for current systems is uh, language ambiguity. Uh, suppose you hear a sentence on the slide, uh, Sam approached the chair with a bag, and without a visual input uh, and without context, this sentence is hopelessly ambiguous. You just don't know whether uh, during the approach the man was holding uh, that bag or whether the bag was already on the chair uh, placed earlier. And uh, uh, these two different interpretations are shown on the slide with two different parse trees. But in fact, most of the sentences that we produce are ambiguous, which leads to the question, how can we understand each other and understand the world if pretty much most of the sentences and, uh, that we hear and we generate uh, have several meanings? Um, our answer is vision to the rescue. Uh, note that seeing uh, a video uh, that depicts the action uh, makes it possible for you to disambiguate the, the sentence that I just showed you and select just the right interpretation. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, uh, uh, Andre um, will um, describe a model that giving an ambiguous sentence and a video uh, finds the correct interpretation uh, of the sentence uh, that correctly corresponds to the video. Yet another example of a very interesting but very difficult problem is um, understanding um, how humans, well, human children, uh, acquire language. Uh, during the first year of um, our lives, we observe the visual world and at the same time um, we hear language utterances uh, that from our parents or their friends uh, uh, which de often describe what we see. And a very important problem uh, is to figure out how based on this multimodal input children eventually acquire uh, language. Uh, Later in this talk, you will see a joint vision and language model which attempts to explain um, how children learn language, not only the meaning of words, uh, which is the lexicon, but also the structure of the language, uh, the parser. Um, it is uh, very interesting that uh, uh, the, the machinery that uh, Andre will describe later that we use to try to solve this problem is actually a generalization of our previous approach to the disambiguation problem. Uh, clearly, we need our children to know, uh, to understand that, you know, something like Jimmy picked up the dog is, means very different than the dog picks up Jimmy. Anyway, to uh, quickly summarize what I said, um, I, I sketched out several potential solutions uh, to uh, natural language problems which uh, work by incorporating uh, vision uh, into language models. Um, other language tasks uh, that could be attacked the same way include uh, paraphrasing, machine translation, and so forth, and Andre will mention that. But in general, we believe that an integrated multimodal approach uh, to the study of human intelligence is actually the way forward. And, um, and it, we are not talking about just language and vision. This is how we started. Uh, we plan to embody uh, our system into a robot and uh, include more uh, modalities. And, um, and again, I, I, I think that this is a very interesting way to move forward. All right, thank you, Andre, go ahead. Sorry, Sir? Am I what? Did you? No, 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 um, HDMI.
It's just the HDMI port is on the opposite side. No thanks. Yeah, so as Boris said, there's a very deep interaction between language and vision. And language can even help you see. It's not just that vision helps you understand language. So I'll give you an example of this. And you've seen some examples um, in Shimon's talk where there were some small patches that you couldn't understand without some greater context. Well, here's something that has the same kind of feel. If you look at this patch, I don't know, can anyone guess what could be there? It doesn't really look like anything. And believe me, even if you saw it up close in high resolution, you still couldn't tell what's there. But once I add the rest of the context of the scene, you can see that it's basically a hammer. And all of a sudden, you can kind of see where the head of the hammer is. You can tell that this is probably a hammer, not a screwdriver. Um, the scene really helps you disambiguate what's going on here. If I gave you a sentence that came with the scene that said the person is hammering, your life would be even easier. And if you look at a whole video of the hammering, our brain is so good at factoring all of this information together that you don't even notice the hammer is invisible in most of the frames of this video. So this is where we started. We, I was originally a computer vision researcher, and we had this problem that vision doesn't work very well, at least in computers. Um, and we wanted to add in some higher level knowledge from language. Now, it turns out the interaction between language and vision is very rich. If you look at an image like this, um, or a video, for example, you can perform many different vision language tasks. So any child can describe this for you. Someone on the left picked up a yellow bag. Or if you see the video and the description, you can recognize, is the description true of the video? I can ask you a question. What color bag did the person on the left pick up? And you can answer the question. You can disambiguate. If I give you a video or an image and I give you a sentence that could mean multiple things, whether Danny is picking up the bag or I'm holding it or I'm picking up the bag, you can disambiguate it. You can learn language if you get enough pairs of videos and sentences. You can resolve coreferences. It's yellow here could refer either to the bag or to the chair. Um, you can resolve coreferences even if you don't have video, if you just have a small paragraph that sort of sets up the scene for you and then you have an ambiguous coreference. You can also handle paraphrasing, for example. You can have two sentences that may or may not mean the same thing. You could either have a sentence or two videos. You could say, measure the similarity between two videos. You could measure the similarity between two sentences. You could do common sense reasoning, as Boris mentioned. You can even translate one sentence from one language to another. You can plan. If I give you a short uh, description of a scene in English, and I tell you what I want the final constraint to look like, you can generate a small plan for me. If I give you a description of that scene as an image or a video, and I tell you the constraint, you can also generate a plan for me. Now what's interesting about these is each of these is sort of its own world. There's a separate community that works on the, each of these problems. The models that we use to address these problems are very different. You can't take knowledge from one model and use it for another. But when you look at what humans do for you know, all of these problems, there's really no difference between them. If you know what an orange is, you can make plans about an orange. If, you, if I teach you how to do something with a screwdriver, you can answer questions about screwdrivers. You can figure out if one sentence is a paraphrase over another sentence with that action that you can perform with the screwdriver. You can figure out how to translate that, senten that sentence into another language. So there's some core ability that humans have that isn't captured if you try to solve each of these problems independently from each other. And that's what we're going to talk about today, which is we're going to go through a bunch of different vision language tasks, like retrieval, generation, QA, all of the ones that I just mentioned up front. And we're going to see how it's possible to put them all into the same framework, handle them all with the same approach, and even more than that, how you don't actually need, say, particular paraphrasing training data. Just having the ability to recognize something is enough to be able to answer questions about it, to be able to understand paraphrases. What we're going to do is we're going to start with just recognition. So one basic primitive that takes a video and a sentence and tells you how true is the sentence of this video. So how good is the video in depicting this sentence? 
I'm just going to describe this very briefly because it's not really the point of the talk. But if you look at a video like this, you have to basically extract some information if you want to understand the sentence, the person wrote the skateboard leftward in this video. You have to know about people, you have to know about skateboards, you have to be able to track them over time, you have to be able to look at the relationships between them. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to do these in this order or that you have to have independent units that do any of these. But this is the kind of information that you have to be able to extract from the video. Indeed, we do all of this jointly. I'm just going to really quickly show you the basics of the model. If you take a sentence, you can extract information from a video. You can extract things like object detections. You can extract information about the objects like their color, their segmentations, their optical flow. You can analyze the sentence with a parser, and you can uh, determine that in this sentence there are three, uh, three participants or the, in the action described by the sentence. The tall person quickly rode the horse leftward away from the other horse. There's a person and there are two horses. Uh, what we do is we instantiate a tracker for every participant that's in the sentence. Trackers are very simple. They're just little hidden Markov models. They don't know anything about the object that they're tracking. All they care about is they want to see detections in the video that are stable. So it's just the intuition that if I have spurious detection in the video, they're not going to be well correlated with each other. So I should see objects that are stable, not objects that are jumping around the scene randomly. Then what you do is you look at every word in your sentence, and every word acts, a, as, acts as a constraint over these trackers. So the word person constrains one tracker, horse constrains another, ride constrains the relationship between the track for the agent and the patient, and it constrains in a particular way so that you can distinguish the agent riding the patient from the patient riding the agent. And you can do the same thing for every word in the sentence. Um, you get this sort of bipartite graph where at the bottom you have trackers and at the top you classify the tracks. And it turns out that if you do this with hidden Markov models both for the trackers and for the words that classify the tracks, you can jointly understand the location of the objects and the time course of the events. So to give you sort of a concrete example of this, you can think of, some, of a word like away as being modeled by hidden Markov model with three states, or uh, approach, sorry, uh, where you're far away from the object, you get closer to the object, and finally, you're near the object. So you have HMMs at the top, HMMs at the bottom, and you perform joint inference. We have many data sets that we've tried this over, uh, but I'll show you one example, and that's in the context of retrieval. So if I have this basic primitive that lets me score a sentence in a video, and I have a large library of videos, I can just take it and apply it to every clip, and I can figure out what are the top-ranked clips for the sentence. Now, you, you might think that YouTube does this, but if you go into YouTube and you type in the if you just type in the verb approach, for example, um, you get videos where there isn't a lot of approaching at all. Um, you get, you know, it's, it's mostly how to approach a woman, to be honest with you, uh, or airplanes approaching runways. And you can do the same kind of thing with different verbs. Um, you can try to put in uh, different agents and patients, and basically you don't find videos that depict the sentence. You find videos that were tagged by someone to have this word. What we did instead is we took 10 Hollywood movies. Um, they're all off-the-shelf movies with off-the-shelf detectors, um, nominally all Westerns. We created a small lexicon um, and a, generated from a, a small grammar. Um, that has to do with people, horses, approaching, leading, riding each other, different prepositions, different adverbs. And we can search through this corpus in order to find um, clips, for example, where the person rode the horse slowly, or the person r just rode the horse, uh, or the horse approached the person, etc. This is not running in real time. This, this is relatively slow. Um, what's interesting about this is the system was never trained on any of the sentences that it's actually retrieving. It's seen training data for sentences that contain the same words, so I've seen it has models for each of the words, but it's building up the meaning of the sentence compositionally. Okay, so, so now we have some ability to link together sentences and videos to understand is the sentence actually being depicted in this video. Something that we can do is we can switch to generation. In the same way that in retrieval we said we have a big corpus of videos and we search over the corpus given a particular fixed sentence, we can think of generation as I have a really big corpus of sentences and I search my corpus of sentences given a particular video. Now, this doesn't really work very well, because even if you take a trivial little grammar that only has a few objects and a few verbs, a few adverbs, um, 
if, even if you ignore the recursion in the grammar, you get a tremendous number of sentences. And that, that's before you use a natural language generation system that can generate many, many more sentences for you. It turns out that there's a trick to making the search very efficient, though. Uh, as long as we constrain ourselves to not producing negation, if you have a prefix of a sentence, it puts a certain number of constraints on what could actually be in that video. The longer the sentence, the more constraints you have, so your cost function's monotonically decreasing um, as you add more words, and this structures the space very well. So basically what you can do is you can say, I don't have a description for this video, I can check all my one sentence, or all my one token, um, sentences or phrases, I can expand that out one by one and basically search the space of sentences lazily. And you can show that you can find the optimal sentence very efficiently this way. We can caption many videos. Here's one example. Uh, we can produce a caption to the person to write if the bin picked up the backpack. And we have many data sets where we've tried this. But, you know, Generation like this is a very sort of unsatisfying problem because you don't often take a picture or video, you walk up to a wall and you try to produce some random sentence. Normally there's a speaker, uh, there's a listener that the speaker actually wants to inform about something. So in order to model this, we said, why don't we try question answering? Um, in question answering, you have a video, you have a question, and you can think of the question as putting a particular prior over the answer that you produce. And it turns out there's a fairly mechanical way um, and reliable way of going from a question to a template for the answer, which contains essentially the entire question. It just tells you that there's a phrase of a particular category or multiple phrases of particular categories that are missing. And then you can use your generation system in order to fill them in. So you can do question answering as long as you have recognition and generation as long as you have recognition without any additional training. Um, there's, there's a little bit more to question answering because if you imagine that we're sitting in a parking lot full of 100 white cars and I tell you I know exactly where your keys are, they're in the white car, this is not particularly informative. It's completely useless. So question answering is really discriminative, so you should produce an answer that isn't just true of, some, of many portions of the video, but it's true of a small restricted portion of your image or your video. And you can do that fairly, um, fairly efficiently. So let's switch to a different task. Uh, we sort of started at the top with tasks that are very vision heavy. Indeed, the very first task that we started with is how to use language to improve vision. We're slowly going to move our way towards more NLP type tasks. So let's take the very ambiguous sentence, like I saw the man with the telescope. It's not clear whether Danny's holding the telescope looking at me or um, he's looking at me while I'm holding the telescope. And what we did is we collected a, vid a corpus of videos like this, like Boris this uh, described, and we can automatically determine which of these two interpretations is true. The intuition for why this works is because even though the sentence in English happens to be, uh, have the same surface representation in both cases, the constraints that are applied to the trackers are different. So what we do is we use a semantic parser that gives us not just the parse tree but a logical representation of the sentence. We can derive the constraints that you're supposed to have on your trackers from that logical interpretation, and then we can recognize which of these two is true. And we tried this for many different kinds of ambiguities, uh, from PV attachment, VP attachment, et cetera. Um, and we have a fairly large corpus. And this is an example of you know, two different logical interpretations. In one case, there's only one chair, in the other case, there are two chairs. When we say, Danny and Andre move the chair, it's not clear whether we're moving the same chair or two different chairs. We can keep going. Um, we can look at language acquisition. So if you have a joint vision language model, it would be very nice if you could also learn the meanings of the words. Um, there are people that work on how do you acquire some meanings of words without any perception, but perception is very good at giving you additional structure so that you need less data. It would be nice not to need billions and billions of sentences in order to learn something. And we're going to sort of artificially divide this task up into two pieces, learning the lexicon versus learning the syntax of the language. And in, when we learn the lexicon, we're going to assume we have, the synt uh, we have a syntax, so we have a parser, and when we learn the parser, we're going to assume we have the lexicon for now. Uh, if you get a, a number of videos like this, and every video comes with a sentence, the sentence doesn't have to describe everything that's going on in that video, it just has to say something that's true. Um, there's a small problem, which is 
This would be much easier if I knew that the word person refers to one particular bounding box, if I knew pickup refers to one particular feature in a time series. But you know, when kids are born, you don't get a rectangle that you're told to put around the teddy bear so that the kid knows what you're talking about. Instead, you can think of this like a constraint satisfaction problem, where I have some constraints between different words, and I know some words need to have high likelihood in some videos, and they might not have high likelihood in other videos. Um, it's basically the same thing as training many hidden Markov models at the same time. Uh, people in speech have been doing this for a very long while. It actually works quite reliably, and you can pick up the meanings of the words with fairly um, little data, with only a handful of examples per word, because they all constrain each other. Um, it, it turns out that if you want to learn a parser, you can extend what we've been doing for disambiguation. Because you can think of the disambiguation as taking an adult parser, and it gives you two potential interpretations for your sentence. Well, if my parser isn't particularly good, maybe I'll get a large uh, distribution that isn't so peaked over potential sentences, and I'll get many thousands of potential interpretations. If you're familiar with Percy Liang's work on semantic parsing with execution, it's, it has the same feel. The idea there is I give you a sentence, and rather than telling you what the correct parse or logical form of that sentence is, I tell you what the result of applying that sentence as a query to a database is. So I tell you that uh, the closest city uh, that the closest city to Genoa is X, and I give you a database of the location of every city, and I wanted to learn how to query that database automatically. This is the same thing, except that we don't provide a database. We provide videos, and the vision language model tells it, is this interpretation of this sentence reasonable for this video? That produces a posterior over the potential parses, given your parser and your collection of videos, and you can use that as a signal to improve your parser. So let's keep going. L let's move from vision. So we talked about some more NLP-related tasks. Let's look at something that doesn't seem to have any vision in it, like paraphrasing. So we gave some of the videos that I've been showing so far and some of the images to people on Mechanical Turk, and we asked them to describe them. And they described these videos and images in wildly different ways, like dark hair man is picking objects from the floor, and the guy in the plaid shirt is lifting the yellow chair. Um, some, paraphrase, some pairs of sentences are very close to each other, like the one at the top. It really describes the same event. Some sentences look as if they're very similar at the token level, but in reality describe very different events, like the man with the chair walks away with someone versus the man walks away from someone with a chair. In one case, one person has a chair, in the other case, a different person has a chair. It would be very nice if we could resolve these paraphrases without actually needing to train a paraphrase system. The way that this is done today is basically you collect a huge corpus of this, you feed it into a deep network, and it tells you whether two sentences are paraphrases from each other. But these systems have a lot of difficulty with any scenarios where the difference is very subtle or very physical, like in this case. So if you think of how you might do this, well, let's see that we have a sentence and we actually have a huge collection of videos. And we search through this collection of videos, just like we did in a retrieval case. And we find a bunch of good videos from here. We find a few dozen or a few hundred videos that have high likelihood. We can take our other sentence with the recognizer that we've already developed. We can put them together and we can ask how correlated are they on these videos. So that's one way to do it, except the fact that as your sentence increases, the likelihood that you're going to find a video that depicts it on YouTube decreases exponentially, so that, that's not very good. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that the model is generative, it's just a combination of hidden Markov models, and we're going to sample videos from the sentence. So one way to think about this is this is paraphrasing with imagination rather than just with vision. Uh, this is something that we're working on now, we're about to wrap up, but just to give you a taste of where we're going, um, hopefully in the fall we're going to start working on translation. And if you look at something like statistical machine translation, it has a lot of difficulties when there's some impedance mismatch between the languages. Like, some languages have gender and others don't, and so it tries to guess because it has no representation of this. And it gets even worse. Like, in Thai, you specify your siblings by age, not by gender. If you look at Chinese sentences, you have some problems because there are no tenses or it's much less common. Some languages use different coordinate systems. Uh, colors are different between different languages, and it goes on and on. And even worse, in Turkish, for example, you have to report why you know something, which would be really nice if we could have that in English for our politicians. Um, 
but there's only so much you can wish for. Um, you, you have to have a model of the world if you want to be able to translate these sentences reliably. And the idea is that if you have two separate vision language systems that have been trained on completely different data, you've never seen an aligned sentence between something like English and French, you can take a sentence in French, imagine a number of videos, you can take your English trained system and describe those videos and ask what's the best description across all of these videos. That's one way to translate and hopefully we'll put that in practice. And to my knowledge, it's the first um, system that's implementable and is sort of cognitively plausible for translation. I'll skip over common sense reasoning, but I'll just say one word about planning because it's a task that doesn't seem to fit into either the category of an NLP type task or the category of vision type task. So you can think of sort of, before we even get to planning, you can think of uh, degenerate case. Let's say that you have the video, so you've sort of seen the execution of the plan, and you have a sentence that describes the plan. Danny carried the backpack to the chair. Oh, there's a typo there. Um, let's assume for a second that you don't have the whole video. So I, I delete the middle portion of this video, but you still have the sentence. You can use the fact that the model is generative to basically imagine the trajectories of the objects and their features. Well, if I get rid of the sentence, and you have the trajectories of the objects and the features, you can recover the sentence. So what we're doing now is we're saying we have neither the middle portion of the video nor the sentence and we sample from both. It's very similar to saying that my planning language is English and my planning domain are the motions of the objects and their features over time. I just want to thank the many collaborators both here and elsewhere. Um, and I think it's sort of an exciting time to be able to handle many different tasks and in particular it's very nice to see that so many different tasks have such sh short edit distance from each other. So it says that maybe one day we'll find an even nicer generalization of this where you can do in order to be able to learn to perform these different tasks in the first place and not just eliminate the barriers between vision and language but completely blur the barriers between all of these tasks.